Yurliet's usually dispassionate face is contorted in a grimace of pain and rage. Your elucidator activates when she begins speaking in her own language. I swear on Cain's riven heart, Moran, you will pay for your treachery. May Morai Hag sunder your fate and cast it away. May the blood of Eldenesh flood your throat. Calm down. It's over. I'm pretty sure you got him. Over? Oh no, Monke. This path is far from its end. Yurliette is almost shouting, her voice ringing with fury. But when we get to Moran, I will make him reveal the full extent of his duplicity and tell me where the truth ends and the lies begin. Please, excuse me, Alan Tech. I allowed the turmoil in my soul to win out over my reason. A slip like that could cost me more than you can ever imagine. My very soul. I must be more careful, even in the face of treachery. Right. So, uh, who's Moran? One of your kin, I take it, right? Moran is the one responsible for the rebellions against the ruler of Janus. But allow me to tell you everything from the beginning. We call ourselves the Children of Asurion. Aldari is another name of ours. We are the echoes of the great empire that once ruled the galaxy and created new worlds. The planet that you call Janus is one such maiden world, the Lolathan, a haven that our ancestors made for their kin. For many millennia, only the shadows of our predecessors lived among the ruins, until you humans came here. We are the heirs, and we are entirely within our rights to call the maiden world our own. However, our arrival is a tragedy, not a homecoming. Sorrow seeps into Yurliette's voice. We belong, belonged to cracked world Kruderok, which fell on the border of this star region. Only the providence of the merciful gods allowed us to escape the fate that befell those whose souls perished amidst the stardust along with our abode. Destroying an Eldari craft world is a serious achievement. I'd like to shake the hand of whoever did it. Abby, buddy, really not the best time for that. His green visor flashing with interest, Pascal carefully clarifies. Which border, exactly? Guys, I'm, I'm really trying to diplomacy here. You don't need to know that, Iron Monkey. I am aware of your looting practices. After the calamity, the Lolathan offered my kin a sanctuary, a place of respite in the ruins of our ancestors, under the canopy of the forests created by the wisdom of our world singers. Living alongside your kind, who reap the fruits of our labor with such vulgarity. So you're one of the refugees from Kruderok. You came here with the others? No. My path brought me to the Lolathan later. Yurliette hesitates. By another route. It was Moran who welcomed me here. He was one of the surviving Farseers of Kruderok. He was with a handful of Asuriani who had escaped death and found the path here to the destroyed cradle of our kind. They were outraged when they saw how the Monke had ravaged our flourishing garden. And this rebellion, I take it that's their handiwork. The Asuriani do not enter battles they cannot win. However, it is in our power to direct the current so that the elements themselves wash obstacles and enemies from our path. And so it was in this case. Moran, the Farseer from Kruderok, saw a future without the Monke, and we followed his lead. We simply used the Monke's passions against them, their love of freedom and anarchy, their love of domination and violence. 
Stoking enmity between servants and rulers is easier when your targets are governed by emotion rather than reason. My kin became military advisors to the Monke who rose up against the ruler of this world. I had a different mission, to become Vicenza's handler, since the rebels would be unable to get to her until both sides were sufficiently weakened. The ruler of the humans had never seen a child of Asurion before, and so she accepted the lie about a degenerate branch of Monke, dwelling far from their own kind. What about that skull we found back at Vyatsa State? And if you're working with Moran, then why did his people attack you? I know not the answer to that question. Yurliette lowers her head. Many cycles have passed since I departed these forests and my kin. They cannot... They cannot have forgotten me, can they? So what exactly is Moran's endgame here? Does he really think that a handful of Eldari are going to wipe out an entire planet full of humans? I mean, I've only been on site for a day, and I've already dismantled half his operation. You struggle to understand the children of Asurion, and I do not blame you for that. We are too different. Yuliet says nothing for a few moments, choosing her words. Monke walk blindly into the future. We choose the path, guided by our Farseers. Kruderak was the birthplace of the powerful Watchers of Things to Come. Our leaders were selected from among their ranks, and their word was set in stone, unshakable, like the universe itself. Moran, our leader here, is one of that group. The children of Asurion are subject to his will, and he is subject to the will of his visions. Moran saw the Lalathan in his vision, suffering and crying out to be cleansed, and we did everything we could to rid the maiden world of the Monke. Our lives, our desires, all that is dust compared to the light of the path Moran has chosen for us. At least, that is what my kin believe. I used to believe it too. Until recently. Oof, yeah. Uh, Preordainment's a whole big can of worms. Especially when someone's taking advantage of it. I mean, not that I'm complaining, but why this sudden fit of candor? Elentech, your arrival has thrown my paths into disarray and lifted the veil on the truth that had been hidden from me. While I was shadowing the human's ruler, I failed to see the signs. Signs that there was another threat looming over the Lalathan, besides the Monkey's deeds. The threat should be familiar to you, as it is to other intelligent species in the galaxy. We call it Silent Thresh, she who thirsts, goddess of chaos. Yeah, yeah, I, I did notice that part. Silent Thresh and She Who Thirsts are the names the Eldari give to the Chaos God Slanesh, their ultimate enemy. Slanesh is the god of passion, excess, and forbidden pleasures, and is known for his fickle and treacherous nature. Disfigurements, it seems you call these mutations, are the surest sign of this threat. By mutilating living forms, this malevolent power subjugates them and bends them to its will. You have seen the deformities in the faces of those who are closer to the Lathan's body than others. The rebels who hide under the canopy of these forests. The Monke are weak in spirit. They are susceptible to the propositions of she who thirsts. And in their drive to attain her poison gifts, they perform perverse rituals in her name. Rituals that require sacrifices. Like the Monke who were brought to the palace and never seen again. The Lalathan's world spirit senses the threat and resists as much as it is able. 
The living things that inhabit this world are becoming its weapons. Weapons turned against the monkey. Poisonous plants, rabid beasts. These are all like a blade in the Lathan's hand as she fights the coming of Silent Thresh. The signs that have been revealed to me, they all indicate the presence of corruption on this world. Tendrils of corruption may be threading through the world spirit, poisoning it even as we speak. But for corruption to take hold of the planet so quickly requires effort. Effort directed by the will of another. Nurliet pauses. I believe Vistenza Viat is enthralled to the will of Silent Thresh. Yeah, yeah, seems pretty likely. What? Vistenza Viat? The governor who has duly served the dynasty and Imperium for decades? Fallon, I hope you will not stand for such scurrilous slander aimed at one of your finest servants. Abby, buddy, you know what? This is my fault. I really, I really shouldn't have used intelligence as your dump stat. Don't worry, I'll put together like a PowerPoint or something. We'll, uh, we'll get you there. As lamentable as it may be, the Imperium's history knows many cases where even the most steadfast followers of the Creed would turn away from his light. Governor Viat had to tap into many founts of knowledge to turn Janus into a prosperous agri-world. Perhaps one of those founts became her undoing. See? Cassie gets it. So hey, look, if your job was to handle Vistenza, then why haven't you already done it? Or let the rebels do it. You actively stopped them when we first got here. There is only one crime graver than serving Silent Thresh. It is betraying the children of Asurion for her benefit. Moran saw the paths. He beheld the future. How could he not see the dark stain on its face? How could he fail to do everything in his power to rid the Lathan of this canker? Nurliet's voice grows angrier, more piercing. Before I rip this poison seed from the Lathan's body, I will make Moran answer me. Fair enough. And look, signs do point towards Vistenza being guilty of what you're claiming. I'm not ready to kill her outright, but we'll definitely look into it. And do whatever it takes to set things right. Perhaps the signs I uncovered have failed to convince you. I pray to the gods that other proof, something more comprehensible to you will emerge to sway your opinion. Silent Thresh is deceitful and cunning. She suddenly penetrates the soul, offering false perfection, luring victims into her web with promises of a wicked ideal. The ruler of the Monkey perhaps does not even know that her soul has been corrupted. Right, exactly. If she doesn't realize what she's doing, we might be able to talk her down. Who knows? Maybe we can talk this Moran of yours down, too. Alright. Let's have a look around here. See what we've got. I mean, mostly vendor trash, I'm sure, but... Perhaps we'll find a clue or two. In the dimness under the canopy, you notice the outlines of machines, portable generators that provide power to the camp. Some of the machines have fallen into disuse and it would be impossible to make sense of the cables and wires strewn about the floor without the help of a tech priest. Ask? Nah, it's fine. I'm sure we've got better things to do than puzzle over the tangled mess that... that gives power to the people. And I suppose if anyone here is going to have anything worth finding, it's going to be those dead Aldari. Let's have a peek. 
Haldari Chainsword, okay. Pretty straightforward. And Aldari Ranger Armor. Ooh. Which at a glance is a small but substantial step up from our current gear. Though sadly it also requires a specialized proficiency talent to actually equip. Though even then I feel like there'd be some logistical issues trying to cram ourselves into Aldari Armor. We'd have to stretch ourselves pretty thin. It's a pretty tall order. Ooh, that's a cool cargo ship. I like the little, um, what I'm guessing are like magnetic cargo clamps on the bottom. A shame we don't see more of the general vehicles of the Warhammer 40k setting in this game. I mean, I get it. It's it's not really the focus. Much like with the Lehman Russ back on Rykad Minoris, it's, it's all just glorified set dressing. Melt-a-gun. Okay. Though, I have to say, that damage seems a bit lower than I would have expected. I'm sure he can catapult, no big deal. Not for our current crew, anyway. And another ranger vest. So really, not much of note here. No unique gear, no lore objects. Interesting. I really would have expected at least something from a, a fight this grand. The floor of the bunker is littered with sleeping bags, backpacks, and the rebels' meager belongings. Clothes smeared with blood, primitive data slates, half-eaten Nutribars. Keep a sharp eye. Huh, okay. So just a bunch of generic cargo for the most part. Weird. Keep your wits about you. Uh, you're Liet? You've probably got this right. Oh, wow, you do. Okay. Neat. Really, honestly, oh, right. <laughs> you're Liet? I sense something nearby. Oh, good, this'll end well. Guys, why don't you uh, back up uh, an extra mile or two? No particular reason. My goodness, that is nerve-wracking. I'm just waiting for that injury pop-up. Gosh, please, please, don't do this to me. Oh, thank you. We have got to ramp up those skill numbers for pretty much everyone in the party. Even the guys I thought were good at stuff are like one in three chances of failure now. Still made it, though. Which nets us yet more cargo and... Ergo boots. Plus 5 agility, plus 10 athletics. Ooh, we really could use that extra athletics. Though, unfortunately, that would come at the cost of our beloved Numo boots. I really hate to give up that charge discount, though I suppose... I suppose the last few episodes really have kind of highlighted that Abby is better off tanking than on offense. Yeah. Yeah, I guess we should. <laughs> well, I've got to say, I failed to see how those boots would actually make someone more agile. 
really kind of feels like more of a tripping hazard to me. All right, well, now that we're slightly less in charge, we push on. Dead Lacerax, that's... Oh. Right, obvious sign of a trap. A Xenos trap. Interesting. I was taught that Xenos were abhorrent creatures. But you do not look terrifying. You look unusual. As do I. Cass, really not the best time for a conversation. Naive child. You are a monster to your own kind. Were it not for your third eye that sees Cheyenne, the thread of your fate would have been severed at birth. Did you want something? All right, Yurliet, I know you're slightly frustrated, what with being shot and all. Still going to need you to take it down like three notches. <sighs> Deep breath. Calm the nerves. And continue. A trivial task. The runes form the lines of an ancient Xenos poem that tells of the creation of a Lolathan, of turning a lifeless dead world into a blooming garden. Ah, oh, no, please. I always have a backup plan. If I had a heart, it would be so attacked right now. And see, this this is why we have her handle it. Mono e mono. I always keep my options open. We good? Huh. Really thought we were down to the wire on that one. All right. Rise to the top or get left in the dust. Coin toss on athletics, my goodness. I guide humanity between the stars. Man, this would be so much easier if we could actually use buffs outside of combat. A soldier would have been disciplined for such a performance. It's cool, bud. You're like 300 years old. Oh, God. Your Seneschal is always there for you. No more, please. I weep the tears of infinite sadness. Thank you. Oh, okay. That that makes me feel slightly better. Ooh, a lore object. All right. Now I definitely feel better. Let's have a look at that thing. Data slate with notes. Kurt, I know it's been rough for you since the meeting by the ruins. First contact leaves an impression on everyone. But when I recommended you to the commander, I... Never thought you wouldn't have the stomach to process the truth. Think what you want, but I'm still your friend. I don't want anything to happen to you because of your own stupidity. I saw your bag with the packs of Nutribars that our lads brought back from the settlement. And if you thought no one would notice a couple of clips missing from Torben's backpack, you thought wrong. I want to give you a chance. Return the goods. You know every Nutribar counts these days. The stuff that grows in the forest is no longer edible, and we're in need of weapons more than ever. I can guess why you need all this. You want to split. Abandon our cause, go back home, and pretend nothing happened. But I'm not writing this to appeal to your conscience. I just want to say that you're a marked man now, Kurt. After meeting the higher-ups, cutting and running is the worst thing you can try to do. They're watching those who've seen them. They won't let you leave. Let's talk. Just talk, you and me, in private. Let me know when you're in the camp. 
Yeah, I can't imagine that ended well. Especially since if this is in fact Kurt's stash, it would imply he never came back for it. It's curtains for that guy. In the back of the corpse's head, there's a strange, narrow hole that does not look like it came from any conventional Imperial weapon. A hole like that could have been left by a thin blade, piercing the skull. Oh yeah, that is a corpse. Think we can maybe guess who that might be? Is there money to be made? And a wraith bone necklace, plus 10 agility, plus 10 perception. For Eldari and Drukari only. Which, I suppose, really does narrow down who might have done this, doesn't it? But on the bright side, free necklace. With some very solid bonuses. Ooh, including a much needed bump on demo checks. Always keep your eye on the price. The plant is covered in pulsating purple spots. Young shoots are already covered in similar marks. Clearly a sign of mutation, not a disease. I mean, I feel like the miniature sarlacc pits are a bit of a clue too, but sure. Dear. Last are acts of violence. We have been ambushed. Just the two? Yeah, we can deal with that. Just need to get Abby and Pask up front. Should be a cakewalk from there. Guard up. Grab their attention. At your beck and call. Set zones, prop up Abby. On it. What of course? DOTs. Cast back up. More buffs. Then we'll go for stuns. Okay, let's not nuke Adira. What is going on? Cass, do you have eyes that in the back of your head? Are always drowned in scarlet. Why is Adira so insistent on being with an eye shot? All right, well, let's not go for stuns then, I guess, because I would really prefer not to peel off our psyker's face. Super, super weird. Isn't this a job for the serfs? Pask? 
move to block. Get pass tech running. Then we'll nerf one, take a pot shot. We'll take it. Very nice. Abby holding strong. Yearly at. Let's get bounty set. If I must. And we'll start a whittle in. This tedium is beneath. Now, Valen, pretty much the same, just in a slightly different flavor. As good as and one out. Keep the other one on you. I will do my duty. Hey, okay, that that wasn't bad at all. That was a much heftier hit than I'm used to seeing out of him. Largely just going through the motions now. We've got this. No way it survives past Pask. If I may. Pask and he shall receive. Oh, and look at that. Level 20. Oh, please tell me we get skill points. One sec, let me get a peek at our options real quick, then we'll uh, then we'll run through this. Right back. And we're back. Sadly, it's just a characteristic boost and an extra action point. Except for Yurliette, who for some reason also gets a common talent. But that said, we are still going to stay focused on bumping our skills. We'll just do it indirectly with primary stats. Intelligence for Valen, for example. That's that's pretty much a given. Then for your Liette, we are doubling down on trying to build up her demo skill. Her characteristic advance will, of course, go into agility, round that out to 60. And then as far as common talents go, it turns out she's already got pretty much anything I might have otherwise wanted to give her. Nimble, swift movement, all the usual suspects. So there's really no reason not to immediately drop it into a skill or characteristic boost. And we, of course, will immediately go for basic skill demo. Which, by itself, is a modest plus seven. But it does act as a prereq for advanced skill demo. 
Though we do need to also bump up our intelligence. That is on my list. Demo just took priority over Xenos lore. I'm just tired of blowing up. After that, we've got Abby. And as we saw, his athletics are starting to flag, so... We'll go ahead and round out his strength. Bring that up to 50. Which will also round his athletics up to 80. Slightly more respectable. We'll bump Adira's intelligence. Need to crank up that warp lore. Though it will also benefit the operative side of her build. Will's a priority too, but I just... I really want to shore up those skills. For Cassia, once again. Bypassing Will for now, in favor of Fellowship. Which will, of course, also crank up her 4,000 social skills. And Pask. No question here. Obviously going right for intelligence. Because why would we not? Half his stuff scales off of it. And that's it. A lot of nice skill bumps. And of course, action point increases across the board. So even with the focus on utility skills, we should still see a marked improvement in combat performance. All right, let us venture forth. Put all these newly bolstered skills to good use. Oh, speaking of which, nearly at. Oh, goodness. Okay, okay, off to a good start. Percentiles looking slightly more favorable. Nice, okay. I have failed my kin. Ah. Well, fair enough, can't win them all. This massive statue, knocked over by an unknown force sometime in the distant past has almost disappeared under the green canopy of the jungle. A giant ravenous creature whose hide is pierced with spikes and spines. The skin around the growths is inflamed, as if the protuberances have appeared recently, causing the creature pain. Aw. Well, now I feel kind of bad about killing those other ones. Not, I suppose, that they really gave us much choice. Hey, bud. What's up? Yeah, that's probably not great. Moron, I assume? The tall being in the fine, long garment turns to you, their face hidden behind the blank visor of their helmet. When they begin to speak, even from a distance, you feel the air around the figure grow cold. Monkey, you should not be here. Yerliette strides forward, her eyes flashing. Moran, I am calling you to account! You said that the great danger threatening the Lalathan lurked in the hearts of the Monkei, in their greed and ignorance. And all the while, another enemy was looming over this world. An enemy whose tracks you should have seen in things to come. Silent Thresh, she who thirsts, is threatening this world. And you hid it from us. Answer me. Did you or did you not behold our greatest foe in the Lalathan's future? Did you lie to me? After Yurliette's words, the two tall Eldari behind Moran start moving. 
One looks around at the leader, while the other lets out a cry muffled under his visor. The rebel beside you cringes as though the Eldari speech causes him pain. He strains to say something, but Moran makes an imperious gesture, and the soldier meekly straightens up and salutes, staring at the Xenos with slavish devotion. And we've got mind control. Delightful. The robed figure inclines their head, and then they begin to speak. You're yet the outcast. You left the path that was set out for you. You brought unknown Monke to our refuge, and now you speak to me with unseemly anger. Your long wanderings far from Kruderak have altered your mind and tainted your sight. Yeah, let's let's see how this plays out. I see no benefit in interrupting. My wanderings are the path I have chosen for myself. Far from the walls of Kruderak, I have seen and come to know things that no other Aldari could, hidden away in a craft world their entire life. Why do you deny my words about Sail and Thresh? Is it because you were lying to me and my kin when you showed us the true path? This Elentak was the first person to discover the coming of Silent Thresh, one of those whom the Mung Kei call Chaos Gods. Without him, I would still be deceived by your words about destiny and the true future. Mung Kei revealing paths. It's ludicrous. Mung Kei bring pain and strife. In our time and for all time. How can you trust a Mung Kei after what we taught you? After hearing the sorrowful song of the dying world, Moran turns his head toward you. It was not chance that brought Kruderok down. Mung Ke destroyed our ancient home, stripped us of our defenses, doomed us to wander amidst the cold stars. The colors of these Xenos are painful to behold, but there is just as much pain in their hearts. Or could it be fear? Despair? I cannot tell. The hues are too strange. Too... Ah! Cassia flinches, and a trickle of blood runs down her cheek. Look, I'm sorry if you lost your planet. That's a tragedy. But I had nothing to do with it. How could I? Moran gazes at you intently. If these words had come from an Eldari, I would have believed them. But you are merely a Monke, a plaything of your own passions. Any emotion that takes hold of your soul can drive out all trace of reason and honor. Not me, I got the computer brain, but point taken. You are playing with words and avoiding the question. Notes of desperation and rage are creeping into Yerliette's voice now. The Lalathan is under threat from our eternal foe, and yet you're more concerned about the presence of the Elentac than the corruption that is flowing through the veins of this world. Did you never consider that your war might simply be hastening Silent Thresh's triumph? Perhaps the ruler's servants, in their efforts to protect her, will resort to more and more instruments of corruption. Moran leans down over Yerliad, his tone menacing. You left Kruderak in our darkest hour to gratify your ego. You came to us on the Lalathan, and I accepted you as one of our own. I even gave you a real purpose, Yerliad the Outcast. And you dare to insult me, a Farseer? It was a mistake to let you into our circle. You have turned our efforts to survive into dust with your own hands. I am a child of Asurion, Moran, not a plaything in the cold hands of fate, which you claim speaks through your mouth. My choice of path is no worse than yours or any other Aldari's, and my path calls me to fight our true enemies, not eradicate the Munke. If it comes to it, I will stand with them. For this Alentech can see what you are blind to, Farseer. Yerliette's eyes are alight with fury. She pointedly lays her hand on her weapon, looking away from the Farseer. Hmm.
for whatever it's worth. This is my planet and these are my people. I'll do whatever it takes to protect them from the arch enemy. Can you say the same? Fah. The words of a creature whose will is ruled by momentary whims. There is nothing you can do to make me believe in the strength of your convictions. You speak of the strength of one's convictions, Moran? You claim it is your destiny to protect your kin. So then what happened to the Aldari you sent to the Monke ruler before me? The Aldari whose skull is now kept as a Monke trinket. That was the previous envoy you sent, wasn't it? Did you see the same fate for me in your vision? His fate was to serve Kruderak, the spirit of our craft world that keeps the Asuriani alive. Your destiny is to do the same, Yerli at the Outcast. As long as you aren't planning to transgress our laws again. Okay, so I do recall that back in beta we ended up fighting these guys. Let's see. Let's see if we can talk them down this time. What have you done to these people? They're clearly not serving you willingly. The Monke believe they are serving fellow members of their tribe, their wise and noble chiefs. My gift is potent enough to ensure that the Monke hiding in these forests see us as humans rather than children of Asurion, and see your primitive structures rather than the traces of our kind. Right, right, so not as bad as I feared, but still not great. Whether you believe it or not, this planet is in danger. So either help me save it or step aside. The name of that danger is Mung Kay, and I will see to it that the Lalaitan is purged of those defiling her face. Then again, there is one way to prove to me that the Mung Kay truly do care about the well-being of their captured world. Eliminate the ruler of the Mung Kay sojourning on the Lalaitan and relinquish the governing of this world to me and my kin. The Lalaitan herself will stand as surety for our agreement, as will your compatriots who live on it, and the profit that you will gain by tilling the Maiden world. Moran tilts his head to the side. Our human helpers will replace the leaders of the Monke. We will be the ones who govern the Lalaitan from the shadows. That's insane. You would help me delay one doomsday scenario just to usher another one in? How long do you think that arrangement would last before the Inquisition got wind of it? What do you think they'd do once they found out? It is not my intention to have my brothers and sisters sit on the Council, Mung Kay. That role would be played by humans. You may choose whomever you wish for this task. As long as they remember who stands behind them, and heed our direction. Moran says nothing for a few moments, then adds mockingly, I suppose my demands can be considered a gift for the likes of you. You could not wish for anything better than Aldari stewards to rule over Monke, without bloodshed. Well, gosh, Moran, when you put it that way, how could I possibly say no? Oh, wait, I've got a bunch of different flavors of no right here. Hold on, let me pick one out. Oh, that's... That's interesting. I do remember that first option, but I don't remember this one at all. I'll tell you what, Moran. As long as we're working towards common goals, the safety and prosperity of this planet and the people on it, I would not be adverse to working with you. Not for you, but as allies. You have to understand, I'm taking a pretty huge risk here. Even as a rogue trader, there are limits to my power, and this... This would definitely strain them to the breaking point. 
The statement predicting future success is fallacious. Security dogmas are based on extensive statistical data on confrontations with Xeno races, and there have been zero cases of successful coexistence. Yeah, I know. Still gotta try. Uh, Lord Captain, are you... Pardon my frankness. Sure you haven't just bitten off more than you can chew? Who told you this idea would sit well with the locals? Moran stares at you for several seconds. At last, he says. An alliance. That is how you interpreted what I said? Then again, if you prefer that word. Let us call it an alliance. Not really instilling me with much confidence here, bud. We will protect the Lalathan, but we will do so without violence. We will work for the interests of our race and our world through trusted Monkei, while we will remain in the shadows of the forest. This will be safer for everyone. If the Lalathan remains in our charge, I am willing to come to an agreement. We will not lose another kinsman, and we will be able to tend to this world, which has suffered so many years under humanity's yoke. As regards the ruling Monkei, Moran makes a strange gesture, and the Aldari behind him take off running into the forest. We will help you. The rebel nods in satisfaction. That's good, that's good. Our commander should stay in charge. They'll know what to do. They'll know what's best. What pleases the God Emperor. He speaks the last word in a barely audible whisper, wincing as if in pain from a splitting headache. Yeah, Moron, we're going to have to talk about this. Your Liette gives you a long, studying look. Wait, Alentech. Before you leave these forests forever, take me with you to the distant suns. The tale of the children of Asurion on the Lalathan is coming to an end. But somewhere out there, among the cold stars of the cosmos that your kind calls the Expanse, there are others, deprived of home, lost, suffering. Yerliette shuts her eyes, and grief twists her finely sculpted features. We can help one another, Elentech. You will be my wings, and I your wounding spear and your voice of reason should you encounter my kin. If that is still not enough, Yerliette thinks for a moment and continues carefully. I promise you a wondrous reward, Alentech. The treasures of my world hidden in the vastness of space in exchange for the rescue of my kin. If you remain true to your word and do not go back on our covenant, You've proven your worth thus far, Yerliad, so I'd be happy to have you. But there's no guarantee we'll find anything out there. You don't think your people here need you more? Yerliad opens her mouth, but Moron cuts her off. Go on, outcast. Your place is on the meandering roads of space, not among us. All right, like I said, you've, you've been a valuable asset so far, and I certainly appreciate your candor. As long as it benefits both of us, you're welcome to come along. As an ally, not just an asset. Well, Malin Tech. Valen, yes? I am tired of titles and designations, my own and others. Since your path lies beyond the limits of the Lalathan, I will go with you to search for others of my kind scattered among the stars. Perhaps they will greet me more warmly than this brood. And remember your promises, Elentech. When we leave the Lalathan, it will be to go to the distant stars. Moran saw them in his visions, and they sang mournful songs about the fate of my people. 
and I will fight beside you until the song of the stars turns into a funeral lament. And we're good with a surprisingly peaceful resolution, which is a bit of a shock given the setting, but um, as implied earlier, it's almost certainly something that'll end up exploding in our face somewhere down the line. As with most of the choices I've been making, you know, I'm I'm doing this blind just based off of gut and instinct, since I've never actually played the game past Act 2. I can't imagine this will end well, but at least in the short term, it's, it's bought us some momentary peace. And you know, like I, uh, like I told Adira, we've got to at least try. Even if the concept of peaceful coexistence goes against the inherent fabric of the setting. That said, we've uh, run a bit long, but I think it was worth it. We'll hit the pause button for now. I'll take care of the usual off-screen bookkeeping, and uh, we will pick up here next time. Time to pay Vistenza another visit. See you then. Oh, and special thanks to the Raiders, the fine folks who help make these videos possible, including but not limited to Revenant, Aloise, Croaking LOR, Dragon Matrix 7, Dracket, Theory V23, Egon Alter, Excelsior, Goat League, James Tremay, Kazor, Mark GMs, and Nathan Welch Jr., Overlord Ferrum, Random Passerby, Robbie B., Thomas Piankowski, Trip Hop and Skip, and Val and Rook. Thanks for your support, guys. That said, if you'd also like to help support the channel, then feel free to push the buttons that do the things. Trust me, it does make a difference. Or you could even check out the PayPal, the Patreon, the Nexus GG, or the YouTube memberships. Links are in the description. A soldier would have been disciplined for such a performance. <laughs>